okay, we're gonna um, we're gonna dive into a series that I believe Lord brought us to for the first of the year, and um, it's uh, the same title as we titled last year called "Born to Build." But we're gonna we're gonna hit it from a different angle and just kind of allow God to work some stuff in us of what this year is gonna look like and how we can be prepared for what's uh, ahead and how God can help us in what we're called to do. And we're gonna walk some things out. Uh, so we're gonna go to the book of Nehemiah. That's in the Old Testament. Uh, so it's where the pages might stick together some for you. Hopefully not, but uh, turn over there, Nehemiah, uh, page 674, if you have a Bible exactly like mine. That's a joke. Okay, here we go. You got to find it yourself. Nehemiah. We're going to be reading out of Nehemiah. And um, <clears throat> I think that the farther we go um, into this year, and, and really year over year, uh, there's plenty of opportunities for us to um, get distracted, to quit. Uh, in some cases, there's plenty of opportunities, opportunities for us to not even start some things that God wants us to start. And so um, I'm encouraging all of us uh, that 2024 is supposed to be a year where we we grow, we increase, we build, and that we don't just maintain a status quo, that, w- that we go to the next level with the things of God, that we, that we uh, attain everything he has for us where we're at and then go to the next, the next step and the next level. And <clears throat> I'll tell you this, uh, the reason why we talk about being born to build is so that we get it on the inside of us what we're made for. We serve the creator who makes everything. He made everything, right? He's the creator of planets and stars, right? I mean, he's, he's amazing. And then he created us after six days of creation, doing this, everything we can see, he created in the six days. And on the sixth day, he made us. And, they, and he made us in, in his image, in his likeness, which means we're like him, which we're not, we're not God. We're, we're like him, which means we're creative too. We're supposed to build too. He told Adam, he said, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion in the earth and subdue it. He's like, go out there and, and get it done do some stuff. And we have no idea how long it took Adam to make that mistake, but he did. And now here we are. So uh, we can blame him for all of eternity, but just be nice to him when you see him because he didn't do it on purpose. Okay. So here we go. So, but we serve a big God and he, and he has things, he has things in us to build. All of us, all of us have this innate desire and ability that is in our DNA from God to be a builder, to build something. And I don't mean just two by fours and hammers and nails, but I mean in life, right? We're building relationships, we're building marriages, we're helping build kids, we're building our church, our community, we're building businesses, we're building uh, better jobs, we're building. We're, there's something in us that just, something's gonna be creative in us to help make something better. And when we get to a place where we, <laughs> we get frustrated or, or, or depressed or just like, we don't know what to do, it's because we're not walking in a gifting we're given. And we're all in different places. We're all, we're all doing different things, but we have a calling for sure. So Nehemiah is actually exiled. He's, he's not in his home country. When, he, when he's uh, starting out reading this, where he's at, he's been a captive in captivity uh, in Persia under King Artaxerxes as his cupbearer. So he's, he's not in his hometown. And so he, He's, he's been built, he's been designed by God for something. And we're gonna read some things here as we dive in and, and get to see uh, what Nehemiah uh, was thinking, what he was doing and what God called him to do. So Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. Is everybody there? Okay, this is, the, this is my another, I'm gonna throw out another subtle reminder to bring your Bibles. Okay, there it is. I love hearing pages turn. All right, Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and I'm, again, I'm gonna say a whole bunch of names here and I'm gonna butcher almost all of them. So smirk and laugh, whatever you want, but I'm gonna just try to get through these as best I can. Okay. Uh, it came to pass in the month of Chrysalib in the 20th year as I was in Shushan the citadel that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. He's inquiring about his brothers, his brethren and Jerusalem, the city. And in verse three, they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem has, is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And so it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Nehemiah uh, had a heart for his homeland. He was 
put into captivity, not of his own choice. It was, it, it was actually his relatives. So he was raised in captivity. But he still, because of the roots that he had in him and God's people in Israel, he had a heart to know how's, how's it going in Israel? How's it going with our brothers? How's it going in Jerusalem? And when he heard that they were in distress and the walls were broke down and that the gates were burned with fire, he wept. Something on the inside of him broke. His heart hurt for that which he valued. And he took a minute and he, and he wept and he cried and he mourned and he fasted and then he prayed. And the rest of this chapter one is a prayer he prayed. And, and we'll touch on a little bit in verse 11. It says, oh Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day. I pray and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer, he said. He's, he's, he's saying, grant me mercy in the sight of the king. Grant me mercy in the sight of this man, this king. Now in, verse, in chapter two, verse one, we see a little bit of Nehemiah's job. job uh, Nehemiah's job is the cupbearer. So that is, that is not a job that we have today that I'm aware of. Anybody in here a cupbearer? Then bringing your kids a cup of water does not count. Okay, <laughs> bringing your wife a cup of coffee does not count. A cupbearer in, in King's times is, this is the guy that takes the king's cup and drinks it first and then sets it down, which is gross to me because I can't, I can't handle sharing stuff. Like if I'm the king, I'm like, nah, mm -mm. Anyway, he, he drinks it and then he gets his sanitizing wipe out and he wipes off the rim <laughs> yeah, right. and he sets it down. And then they give him a couple of minutes to see if he kicks it, if he dies, if he keels over, then we find out who poisoned the cup, but then the king doesn't die. That's the cupbearer's job. That's your full-time job, to, to see if the food is poisoned. I hope the benefits are good, right? So, <laughs> so he's standing in front of the king, and, and anybody that's serving the king, they know this. This is kind of a rule of thumb. You do, not, uh, you do not wear your life and your troubles on your sleeve when you're in front of the king. Your countenance is up. You're happy. You're upbeat. You're taking care of things. You don't you don't come in droopy with the teenager swag. You don't do any of that. You, you, you handle your business at home and you bring it, you bring it to, to bring your best to work. That's what you do. And so in verse one, it says, it came to pass in the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes when wine was before him that I took the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had never been, never been sad in his presence before. He knew his job. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. He realized, oops, it slipped. Well, we know what happened. Just, he just spent a few days, probably took some sick leave because he said he fasted and cried and prayed for a few days. So, you know, the backup, the backup guy that can die is on, right? <laughs> That's a great call. You're up. You're up. <laughs> So he comes in, he's sad. The king notices and asks him, this isn't, this isn't sickness, this is sorrow of heart. What's going on? And he's like, uh-oh, oh, I broke it, I, I blew it. So in verse three, he said, and, the, and, and said to the king, may the king, this is Nehemiah, I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? And the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Now that prayer is what he prayed in, verse, in chapter, chapter one. He gives us insight to how he prayed because we, we see it here. Lord, grant me mercy in the sight of this man, right? So we see that prayer. So he prays, Lord, oh man, I, gotta, I need help. You know what to do. Give me, give me favor and mercy in the sight of this man. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I set a time. That's like getting your prayers answered right now. Yeah. He's the cupbearer. This is a guy that's close to the king. Like he's around for all the conversations. He, you know, they probably, you know, have some sort of dialogue back and forth. He trusts him. You, you gotta trust your cupbearer because if he's, if he's the guy that's gonna poison your stuff, that's the guy you gotta get to, right? He's gonna sip it, and then he's gonna be like, <laughs> put something in there, and then set it down, right? So you, you gotta have a good relationship with the cupbearer. He likes him. Now he's just given him permission to leave for a long time, a long time. He's, he set a time, but you're gonna rebuild walls. That's, we got some time. But he's got favor, and he says, yep, 
go. And so then, then uh, he set him a time. Then verse seven, then he, then he goes in addition. He goes, furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they may permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And I need a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me the timber to make the beams for the gates and the citadel, which pertains to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Favor, everybody say favor. Favor. Come on, something about Nehemiah in this place where compassion rose up in his heart because of what he read about his city, his hometown, where his fathers are buried, come on, his ancestors, the the condition of Jerusalem and the people that are there in great distress. Something on the inside of him moved him to action. It caught him almost off guard in front of the king because his countenance had let down. And the king asks him. Now he's like, okay, God, I need favor. I messed up. I messed up. I need some favor. And, And God gives him favor and grace and the king grants him all of his requests. This is, a, this is a compassion in Nehemiah that rose up in him because God had something for him to do. So how does this pertain? This pertains to every single one of us. Every single one of us. There is something that rises up in us that, that pulls compassion from us for a purpose. Not just to say a quick prayer or maybe throw some money in the plate, but something compassion on the inside rises up because God's trying to get us to a place where we'll step out and do something about it. It's, it's not until we take that first step of action that stuff starts to happen. What, what if he'd have said, now why, now why are you sad? He said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, King. King, live forever. I, everything's okay. Everything's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it. I'll fix my face. I will fix my face. What if he said that? He doesn't, he doesn't get another ask. The king says, what's going on? And he tells him, and he says, what's your request? And he lays it out, he says, done. See, the other thing this tells me is this, is that when we're moved by compassion and we're moved by the spirit of God to, to act, to step out, to take a step, God will bring us people, bring us resources to get done what we need to do. Amen. Are you hearing me? The, the problem with us is, believers, is that, we pray and we ask God for the resources before we start to act. And it doesn't work that way. He didn't, he didn't know what the king was gonna do. He didn't know the king was gonna say, what's your request? He didn't know that. He just told him, this is, this is, why, this is why my countenance has fallen. This is why I'm sad. Compassion moved him to take a step. And the king says, what's your request? Are you following me so far? There are things that I've figured out in life when I hear from God that, that if, I, if I start to act on it, other things come into place. You make a phone call. You make a connection. You set a meeting. You, you educate yourself. Like, okay, why is, this, why is this pulling on my heart? Maybe I need to look this up. Maybe I need to Google this and find out what it looks like to fix this problem. What, what could I do in my community? Because this is pulling on my heart. What would that look like, right? You start taking steps. You start, and people start coming to find you. This is how it works. It's too quiet. It's too quiet. This is how it works. We, we, gotta, we gotta step out in action. So he does and he gets it and he says that he gets all these things granted to him according to the good hand of my God upon me. So he went to the governors beyond the river, gave him the king's letters. This is verse nine. And now the king had set captains of the army. The king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So not only did he give him stuff uh, that he asked for, the letters and the ability to get the timber he needed, the king also sent him captains and horsemen and horses. That, that's good, right? That was extra. He went above and beyond to help somebody that he liked, that, showed, that God was showing favor to. See, there's no limit to the resources that you can have access to when you're doing what God called you to do. He'll, he'll, bring, he'll bring people and stuff out of the woodwork to help you accomplish what he's called you to do. Now, if you're doing it on your own, that's a whole other animal. We gotta make sure we're hearing from God right? The the pull of our heart, the compassion of our heart, there's things in us that will draw us to things of God. There's also distractions. We got to discern, decipher. As believers, is this God or is this just me? Amen. So he goes above and beyond. He's getting help coming out of the woodwork here. This is amazing. So he gets to these areas. He finds Sambalot, the Haranite, and uh, Tobiah, the Ammonite, and these officials, they heard of it, and they were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. 
These other governors were deeply disturbed that somebody was checking on Israel. Do you see how Israel's been dealing with this for thousands of years? I mean, this is, this is prejudice. This is, this is uh, all kinds of problem, bias and, and bigotry. Why, why are you checking on Israel? They're nothing. Why are you bothering them? They're, it's all, they're, their walls are torn down. They have no gates. Why? It bothered them that someone was checking on Israel. Amen. Come on, that's why we love Israel. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We support God's people. Amen? Amen? So he came to Jerusalem, this is verse 11, and he was there three days, and he rose in the night and with a few men with him, and he said, I told no one what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Nehemiah had in him what he wanted to do. He told the king he got resources, but he wasn't blabbing about it. He got there and he still hadn't told the people there yet. He had just got there. He was there for a few days. Now, in the next few years, as it says that he went out uh, several of the gates, he went around the walls. He was, he was doing reconnaissance. He was checking it out. How bad is it? Where, are the stones here? Are there people around? Can we get this done? Is there, is there obstacles in our path? What, what do we need to do? He was checking out what was happening around the city gates. And he hadn't told anybody yet. And he went out by night and he came back in. And then uh, down in, in uh, verse 17, he said, then I said to them, you see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste and its gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he spoke to me. So they said, let us rise up and build them. Then they set their hands to this good work. He got a, yeah, New King James, yep. Yeah. Nope, these are the people. These are the people of Israel. So he told the people of Israel, there's people there that were in distress. There's a handful of people there. Not a lot. They were living, eking out in existence. And, and they, he came, he's a Jewish guy. He came and he said this to them. And he said, let's, let's rebuild our wall. Let's rebuild, let's get it done. And they said, let's put our hand to this work. So these are people that have basically lived behind broken walls, lived behind broken gates. They're, they're not secure. People have plundered that place, taken advantage of it, broken it down. They're just trying to basically eke out an existence. The, the, the few people that are left. And yet they're still, it's still Jerusalem. It's still Israel. It's still their home. They just, nobody was there to lead them, to help them rebuild it. They didn't have the resources, the help, the favor. They were just surviving. But he comes before me and says, let's do this. This is what the king said. These are the resources we have. And they said, they heard these words and they said, let us rise up and build. And they set their hand to do this good work. That's amazing. Then in verse 20, he said, I answered them and said, God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants will arise and build. But you have no, inherit, or no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. When he was replying back to the commanders of the armies that were outside, trying to dissuade him from rebuilding the wall. So Nehemiah got it in him. He got a vision of what it was. He got resources and provisions to get it done. Now he's tasked with exciting the people around him. Hey, let's rebuild the wall. Let's rebuild the wall. And God provided the provisions and then God provided the people. It's amazing. So in chapter, in chapter um, where are we at? In chapter three, we see a little bit of a picture of, of who's, who's helping, who's building the wall. So one of the things that we have to think about when Nehemiah is looking around and he's checking out, uh, doing the reconnaissance, checking out what's going on with the wall. This is, this is something that leaders do. Leaders uh, look at a task and try to take it all in and say, okay, God, how do we, how do we get this done? How is this, how is this set up? How do we organize this? How do we lay this out? Who, who are you sending? Who, who's gonna help us get this done? And, and Nehemiah kept what he wanted to do until he got to see what was going on. Now, now, just you know, a few months earlier, whenever this was, how long, however long it took him to travel there, Nehemiah had something in his heart. He was burdened by uh, what was going on in Jerusalem with the broken down walls and the gates and that his, his fellow countrymen were in distress. But, he, but in that moment where he's praying about it, thinking about it, um, um, fasting, it said he, he, he wept over a few days and then fasted and prayed, he's getting a picture, a vision of what it looks like to get it done because we know this because he didn't just come up with what he needed on the fly. When the king asked him, what do you request? He said, well, this is what I need. I need, I need letters to the governor so I have protection so they don't, they don't wipe out our caravan on the way there. And then 
on the way there, we're gonna pass through the king's forest and we need wood. So if you've never been to Israel, there's not a lot of wood there. It's a lot of sand and rock and dirt, right? The, the trees that grow don't grow big. So the cedars of Lebanon is a legit thing and that's way farther north. So he, he has already planned, like if we're gonna rebuild these gates and these posts and these beams, we gotta pick that stuff up on the way. Do you see how, how he's, he's making a plan? Something in his heart pulled him to do something about it. And then in that conviction, in that compassion, he began to make a plan of what it would look like to get this thing rebuilt. What do we need? What do, what do I need to take with me? I mean, we don't wanna travel all the way there and then go back 100 miles or 200 miles back to Lebanon to get the, the, the wood. That's crazy. We can get that on the way, like, right? Does any, is there anybody in the house that does not like to backtrack at all? Am I the only one? Okay, so there's several. It's like, that just bugs me to no end. Like if we can hit the gas station that's on the way home, we don't have to go 75 miles out of the way to save three cents a gallon, I will do that. You know what I mean? I, I just, I don't like to backtrack. I like to like, let's get it as straight of a line as we can. Let's hit all the stuff and let's get home. And, and if something comes up where you gotta go back, I gotta gather myself. <sighs> okay, you know what I mean? So I'm feeling Nehemiah right here. It's like, let's get it on the way, right? But he, but he had a plan. He had a plan. And, and I'm telling you, when, when God puts something on your heart, he will also help you with the plan. And, and it's, it's because somebody, as you start to take action, is gonna ask you, what can we do? How can I help? How can we resource you, right? If you don't have an answer for that, then you, you're wasting time. You got a plan. Somebody that wants to resource you, the people that, the people that have resources that wanna help, they appreciate people that have their stuff together. Are you hearing me? Yeah. When you come to somebody and like, hey, I got some resources for you, what do you got? And they got a plan, you're like, this person has their stuff together. Let's get this done. Yeah. Are you following me? Yeah. The him and the Han and the, you know, I could use three red balloons and a pony and they're like, what, what, what? <laughs> like, oh, that was, just my, that was just my kid's birthday list. No, I mean, it's like, you gotta come up with a plan and be ready to go. So if he's putting something on your heart, pray about it. Spend some time. He will give you some wisdom and direction and help so that when somebody asks, and they will, as you take action, you'll know what to say, amen? So now he's rallied the troops. He's told them that they have the backing of the king, the help of the king, the support. He says, we're here, we're, we're, we have letters to pass through. We have the cedars of Lebanon. We have what we need. Let's get it done. And they're like, yes, let's build it. They get excited. The people get excited. So in chapter three, it just starts listing uh, uh, some of the, kind of outsiders, if you will, that jumped in and started building walls. You know, there was all different kinds of people that were here and not all of them were stonemasons. Not all of them were good at building walls. They had other things they did. Right, right here in verse one of chapter three. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and built the sheep gate. This is the high priest. This is, this, the high priest is the top God, the top dog, not, dog, not God, the top dog, the big cheese in the religious order. Like he's the one that God's ordained and anointed to come into the temple, the Holy of Holies, and do the, the sacrifice once a year for the whole people. He's the guy. So for him, I mean, th this is not work he's used to doing, right? I mean, we're talking about, you know, not sandpaper hands, but soft hands, delicate hands, right? I mean, when I was in construction, your hands, they get callousy and, and tough. And I mean, you just, this stuff doesn't, you don't have to wear gloves for very long. Well, you get out of construction for a couple of months and my hands are baby soft again. And I liked it when they were rough. But that, I mean, that's how it is. When you work with the stonemasons, they had rough hands. This is the high priest. He says, we're helping, we're helping to build this wall. Him and the priests that were with him, they got up, they rose up, they started building the sheep gate and they consecrated it and they hung its doors and they built as far as the tower of the hundred and consecrated it. Then as far as the tower of Hananel, they went both directions from the sheep gate. Do you have that picture? The high priest and his priests went both directions from the sheep gate. And um, you can't read that. I can only read it this close. But the red, the red, the sheep gate's right in the middle on the far end, sheep gate. They went both directions, tower of Hanel and then down toward the other tower. So, these priests who are skilled at scripture, transcribing, uh, understanding the word, uh, declaring the word to people, they're skilled at praying, hearing from God. These, they cinched up their robes and got busy on the wall. That's a big deal. Are you guys, are you guys with me so far? 
So they keep reading. Then uh, verse, verse two, next, Eliashib, the men of Jericho built, and next to them, Zakur, the son of Imri built. Also the sons of Hananah, uh, Hassanah built the fish gate, don't mock me, then, the, then laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Next to them, uh, Merimoth, the son of Urijah and the son of Koz made repairs. Next to them, Mushalam and the son of Barakai, the son of Shagai, and made repairs. And next to, the, listen, if you're looking for baby names, this is a great place to go right here. This baby's loaded. You got all kinds of good ones. All, I want to see some Kazes and some Urijahs. I'm telling you what. And, 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 and they kept building, but Anna made repairs. And next to them, the Ticoites uh, made repairs. That, they're from Tico. That's right over here by Idaho. And, and they're nobles, and they did not put, uh, their, the, 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 this is what it says. Uh, the Ticoites made their repairs, but their nobles did not put their shoulder to the work of their Lord. That's an interesting phrase right there because it kind of feels like, like uh, somebody got thrown under the bus right there. Yeah. You do not want to be in scripture where God throws you under the bus. But he calls them out. He says, these guys were too big for their britches and they didn't put their shoulder to the work. Another version, they didn't put, they didn't put their neck to the work. They didn't, they didn't even try. You know, it doesn't matter what you are or what title you have. You can be too prideful to do the work of the God. Did you know that? You don't have to be a noble or a leader or a, a leader of people to fall into this category. You can just be too uppity, too busy. I can't, I, I, just, I just got the manny. I can't do it. I can't, are you listening to me? These guys, they wouldn't help. And they're in the book as not helping. That's not where I wanna be. You know, I wanna be Zadok and Mashulam and these guys that are like, hey, let, we're doing this section of wall. Just get out of my way. Let's get this done, right? These guys, we're, we're, we're too good for that. They're in there. They made the book. Sorry, guys. Didn't throw their names in there, so he saved them a little bit, right? This is nobody's naming their baby after that guy. Okay. <laughs> Moreover, Jehoda and the son of Peseah and Meshulam, the sons of Be uh, Besedea, repaired the old gate. They had laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Now skip down to verse 8. It says this, next to him, Uziel, the son of Harina, uh, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs. A goldsmith. Again, Somebody else outside of their wheelhouse. They're good with making utensils and overlaying things with gold and, and weaving gold into apparel. Goldsmiths do all kinds of different things. They don't build walls. But you know what? All hands on deck. This isn't just benefiting other people. Everybody involved in this wall building is getting a benefit from the wall being up. Amen? And we're not talking about bob wire fence and T posts. We're talking about stones. Some of them good size ones. They have to be joined and fit in a way that the wall on both sides ends up smooth so it can't be scaled by the enemy. They're putting some sort of clay or mortar or some sort of joint compound, whatever they had then, that fills in those gaps. So it takes some time and it takes some thought and some effort. But everybody involved in this is benefiting from this. Are you hearing me? So the goldsmiths jump in there. And then also next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers made repairs. This guy's Estee Lauder rep. <laughs> he just smells good everywhere he goes. He doesn't know how to work with stones, but he knows that this is a benefit to everybody. See, we gotta stop disqualifying ourselves from what God wants us to do because we don't think we have the skill set for it. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you can't obey God when he says go or build or do this. There are things we find out that we're good at that we didn't know we were good at because somebody in our life pushed us to try it. That's awesome. I mean, I got kids like this, right? I'm like, hey, we're gonna do volleyball this year. I don't wanna do volleyball. That sounds terrible. You're gonna love it. They try it. They get out there and do it. They like it. I mean, I'm telling you, sometimes you just need somebody to get, get you out there. And then you get out there and you either find out, yeah, I like it or no, I don't, but at least you tried it. But when you're following God, it doesn't matter whether you like it or not. If he says, do it, you just do it. You just know it's to your benefit. Just know whatever, whatever section of wall you're working on that he's told you to do, it's for your benefit and the benefit of those around you. Amen? We just gotta be willing to do it. Come on, if the perfumer can start moving stones, y'all, we can help in the kingdom, can't we? So all these people, man, they're just jumping in, jumping in and helping. Verse 12, and next to him, uh, was Shalom, the son of Halohesh, leader of half the district of Jerusalem. This guy is in charge of some stuff and he's building a wall. And it says this, he 
and his daughters made repairs. Where are my kids? Where are my kids? He and his daughters made repairs. Come on. The girls are involved. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Everybody's on deck here. Nobody's getting out of this. They're working. They're building the wall. They're doing what God called them to do. Why? Grace and favor was on them. Nehemiah was, was anointed and gifted and God called him to be in that place at that time in that hour to lead a group of people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, to reestablish uh, and reinstall the gates. Come on, this establishes so much for them. It gives them another place of their own. It gives them protection. It gives them a place where they can now establish government again, where they can have uh, you know, um, security and, and business and trade with other places, build up an army. Come on, when you, don't have, when you don't have walls up, you don't have these things. You're just eking out an existence. Amen. The next verse, it says that there's another group that they repaired a thousand cubits of wall as far as the refuse gate. That's a third of a mile. When was the last time you walked a third of a mile? Some of you feel like you did because you're parked way, way, way over there. <laughs> That's not even a quarter mile. That's like a tenth of a mile. Third of a mile. They repaired a wall a third of a mile. And again, these aren't T-posts and barbed wire. These walls are thick. I mean, for the age, the time, the day, the walls were so thick you could ride a chariot around them. In some cases, they're so thick you can ride two chariots side by side around them. When we're talking about, this is a project, people. This is a project, and that they're doing it with the right heart and attitude. God's resourced them. He's helped them. They have a leader. Let's get it done. And over and over again, people are stepping up, stepping up, stepping up, helping. Again, verse 31, there's another goldsmith that jumps in and helps and steps up and, and offers his help to build in sections and parts of the wall. So while we're reading this and we're looking at this, all, all of us, all of us, God has put something in us, part of our DNA to build. And we find out uh, the things that we're called to do many times by what's pulling on our heart. Come on, not, I'm not talking about pity. I'm not talking about when they play that commercial of all the animals that have been abused, right? In between your football game, right? And you watch that and you're just like, why are they playing Sarah McLaughlin right now? This is, <laughs> I'm not talking about like your heart pulls out for, for animals. I'm talking about something in you that is God-ordained that's supposed to be drawn out to be a blessing to people. And when we, when we figure out what that is and we start to do it, even just a baby step, come on, stuff starts happening because you cannot steer a docked ship. You can turn the wheel all you want, left, right, nothing happens. It's gotta be moving. So you take a step and God starts helping. Are you with me? So, so Nehemiah's taken a step. He's rallied the troops. He, he's brought these people in and they're beginning to see some progress. They're beginning to see some amazing things. They're seeing so much progress, so much moving so quickly because they've all come together that their enemies, the ones that they pass through and talk to on the way, they're starting to talk and make a plan to gather an army to come against them to discourage them from completing it. And again, we're right back to modern day Israel's enemies, come on now. This has been going on for thousands of years. People trying to, trying to put down Israel, get them out of the way, move them off their land. I mean, this has been going on for a long time. And they're trying to dissuade them, discourage them from doing what God said. Let's rebuild the walls. Let's rebuild the temple. Let's get this done. I'm telling you, God will win. Let's just, just determine to not fight God. How about that? Sound good? So they, they try to set up armies, try to come in and scare them off their, off their space, and Israel gets wind of it. They find out, oh man, they're gathering against us. They're gonna, they're gonna come kill us. We, we're not, it's not done yet. Uh, there's a verse in here that says they've, they've been all the way around the city and they're halfway up in just a, f a few weeks. I mean, they're, they're cooking. It's moving, and, but it's not quite there. And so they get distressed. They get worried. They get confused. And again, Nehemiah's kind of rallying the troops again, and he's trying to help them out. But let's read a little bit. <clears throat> it says, uh, chapter four, verse one. So, but so it happened uh, when Sanballat uh, heard that they were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and he mocked the Jews. Kim. And he spoke before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they, will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish, stones that are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him 
And he said, whatever they build, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone. They're just, they're making fun of them. They're mocking them. And uh, it says, hero God, verse four, hero God, for we are despised. Turn their reproach on their own heads. Give them plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. So this is Nehemiah saying it. So we built the wall and the entire wall was joined together up to half its height for the people had a mind to work. The people had a mind to work. <sighs> Boy, I got a medal right here just for a second. Uh, young people, you gotta have a mind to work. The, the idea that the government is gonna support you is insane, right? The government is not here to support you in your video gaming. You, you, gotta, you gotta have a mind to work. Now, this is for everybody. We gotta have a mind to work. We gotta put our hand to something. That, that's where the blessing of the Lord comes in. When we, when we get up and we put our hand to something, God will bless the fruits of our labor, amen? It's even more blessed when we're doing what we're called to do. That's even better. But we gotta have a mind to work. That means as long as we're on the ground here before Jesus comes and gets us, you will work all the days of your life with a rest day. Six days off a of seventh. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Gotta take a rest day. But we're gonna work. That's just, that's just life. That's how it's gonna be. And I got news for you. This might make you a little sad, but when we're in heaven, you're going to have jobs to do too. That's right. That's right. You're going to have stuff to do. Except there, you won't ever get tired. And there you eat for fun and not because you need it. Right? right? And there we have, we have uh, worship breaks. And we just break down, just worship God right in the middle of what we're doing. Drop that hammer. Come on, we got to praise God right now. <laughs> Lord Jesus, this is good. It's way better. But here, we got to just wrap our head around. It's work time. Come on, not just for our stuff and not just to, to build our nest egg and not just to build you know, our legacy. That's not, that's not why we're here. We're here to build the kingdom of God. Amen. That means we gotta find out what he said and we gotta do it. And it will be in conjunction with, with what you're already doing. God's helping you. He knows what you need. He knows the bills you have to pay. He's not asking anybody to quit their jobs today. Maybe he's talking to you, but maybe not. You, you got stuff to do. You gotta pay the bills. You gotta do the work. You gotta, but just understand, we're gonna work until Jesus comes back. That's just how it is. These people, they had a mind to work. Verse seven, now it, ha it happened when Sambalot and Tobias and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were being restored and the gaps were being, beginning to be closed that they became angry and they conspired together to come and attack Jerusalem with, and, and, uh, and create confusion. Nevertheless, we made our prayer to our God and because of them, we set a watch against them night and day. At this point, uh, while they're going, they realized they could be attacked at any moment. So they set a watch night and day. The further into the scripture, it actually says that uh, there were many that worked while they're carrying stones and working with one hand, they had a hand free for their weapon because some, somebody could come at any moment and they would have to defend their lives and the lives of their family and their brothers and sisters. Are you hearing me? Well, how that translates to us is this. No matter what you're called to do in this life, there will be adversity. It's just the way it's gonna go. Anytime you're doing something for God, the enemy's gonna push back on you. The world is gonna push back on you. It's gonna happen. It's part of the deal. We have to be prepared for battle at any given moment. That means you can work with one hand and be ready for battle with another. Hand on the hilt, hand on the sword, right? There, there is a way to do this life, to do what God's called you to do, but be prepared for battle. And when you read farther into this, they actually ended up never attacking them because they found out they were prepared. They found out they were armed. They found out they set an, a watch at night and day. They found out that behind the walls while the workers are working, there were actually people standing guard waiting for an attack that they could just go right to it. And they said, Man, it's not worth it. They're already prepared for us. Being prepared ahead of time is brilliant because most of the time your enemy doesn't wanna fight a well-armed foe. Your enemy doesn't wanna fight a well. They want a surprise attack. They want a sneak attack. They wanna catch you unaware. But if you're prepared for battle while you're doing the work, a lot of times it's just all bark and no bite. Are you hearing me? So, but we gotta stay prepared. We gotta, we gotta know the things of God. We gotta know the word of God. We gotta know what he said to us. That's how we arm ourselves, the armor of God. We gotta arm ourselves and be ready to fight. Come on, God told you to do something. He's given you wisdom and direction. And if the enemy comes against you, you come back at him. Nope, this is what God said. This is what his word said. This is what he's put in my heart. He's given me the ability and the, and the capability. Get this done. Amen. So no matter what we face in 2024, and I promise you, it's gonna be a year of wins 
It's gonna be a year, a year of highs. There'll also be some lows. There'll also be some tough times. I promise you, 2024 is gonna be a challenging year for a lot of different reasons, a lot of different reasons. Some of it's because it's an election year. I mean, that's just how we roll around here in the US in these, these days. It's an election year. However, God's with us and we still have a call to do and we still have things to build. There are, there are sections of this that we need to build. And, and part of this, as you're reading through who, who is building where and what, is that there are sections like the priests, they, they, they connected a huge chunk of wall. They built this gate and they went both directions. The priest did and built a, a big chunk of wall. But then it breaks it down and it starts talking about other names and other families. And it says that, it says that uh, um, Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Kaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of uh, Eliash, um, Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. And then it says uh, in several other places that they built the house, they built the wall right in front of their house. Several different families. Their section of wall was right in front of their house. So we see just from reading a little bit of Nehemiah that there were people that were capable of taking on tasks that were more, bigger chunks of wall. They were, they, were, they were ready and able to take on larger projects. There were other folks that they were just tasked with, you know what? You just work on this right here. This is your spot. Fix this. I'm telling you, when you're working on the wall right outside of your house, you're motivated, yeah. right? I mean, that, if, you're, if yours is the one that's, that's broken down, guess where the enemy's coming in? If you didn't do your job, right? Little Bill Belichick, right? Do your job. Again, four people got that. Okay. <laughs> you do your job, you fix your wall, then you're not the weak link. See, we're, we're super close uh, to, to going over some things and really getting into some really great areas with the Lord. I mean, there's, there's some things that we're coming through as a church that God's just gonna explode into our lives and the lives of our community. We're, we're right on the cusp of some great things. Come on, I believe building the church is one, one of those things. It's really gonna set this community on fire for the Lord. I believe it, I believe it with all my heart. But, but right now, many of us are in different positions. And sometimes God's asking us, hey, you need to take care of the wall in front of your house. You need to get this fixed. You and your wife, you need to be good. You and your kids, you need to be good. You need to take care of this. This is your home. This is your base. This is, you need to get this right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. These are important things. We need to get these things right. Because when, when your marriage is good, come on, and your kids are good, your household's taken care of, now God can expand what you can do because the wall's fixed. You're, you don't have to work on that wall anymore. It's done. It's good. It's secure. It's, you got to maintain, but you've, you've, you've repaired the breach. Right. Yes? Yeah. Now he can give you a, a bigger assignment. Now you have access to go on different parts of the wall to help others that need the help. Are you with me? Yeah. So, so all of these people listed, man, they, they were in different places, and we're all in different places, what we're dealing with, what we're working with. But God's helping us. Just do what he called you to do. Work on the part he called you to do. If it's right in front of you and you need to fix that, just do it to the best of your ability. Get it, get it fixed, get it repaired, get it good. And then know there's another assignment coming. There's another assignment coming, amen? And we're all, we're all in different places and we're all doing what God's called us to do. If we all do our part, the wall will go up. Amen. It, the breach will be repaired. The gates will be on. We'll be fortified again, doing everything we're called to do in the kingdom of God. But we gotta work, we gotta work together. That's who we are. And so Nehemiah shows us over and over again, come on now, this is what we do. So when he, when he put the guards up there, when he, when he prepared them for battle, the enemy just said, it's not worth it. Come on now, we gotta prepare. This is the first Sunday in 2024. It's gonna be a good year. Amen. It's gonna be a good year. It's gonna be good because not only is God gonna show up, but we're gonna see his faithfulness in his hand in our lives as we overcome adversity. And some, so those are the best wins on the planet. When you just easy win, when the other team just straight forfeits and you just walk off and you, you didn't even get to play the game, that's not satisfying. It's satisfying to play the game, play it hard and get the victory. Overcome adversity. Come on, by the hand of God in our lives. That means we're gonna have to repair some things that are right in front of us. Let's stop, let's stop overlooking that and try to fix everybody else's wall when our walls need some fixing. Amen, and we'll fix them, and God will honor that, and he'll help us, and then he'll give us a better assignment, a bigger assignment, assignment that involves more people, impacts more people, yes? Are you with me? 24 is gonna be a good year. We're gonna have to go after some things. We're gonna have to have our hand on the sword and be working with the other, ready to fight so that it staves off the enemy, yes? Amen, did you get anything at all?
Come on, we're gonna stay in this series for a few weeks, Born to Build, talking about how we can build some faith, some hope in us, talk about love a little bit. Come on, these are cornerstones, building, bro- building blocks of, of how we follow God. And he's gonna help us, amen? amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I just thank you for what you're doing in us. I thank you for what you're doing in our church and in lives here. Holy Spirit, we asked you when we started that you would speak to hearts and minds, that you'd speak things into our spirits that only you can say, only you can speak. So I'm trusting, Holy Spirit, that you've done that and that people are being stirred even now to look back to see uh, what pulls on their heart, what compassion is in them, to follow after you, to be led by your spirit, to, to do things in the kingdom. I thank you, Father, for showing us in Nehemiah what it looks like to do our job, to repair the breach, that it can be done. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Help 2024 to be a year, Father, that we hear you better. We, we get closer to you and we know your voice better than we ever have, that we follow you better than we ever have. Thank you, Lord. You're so faithful. You're so good. Heads bowed and eyes closed still. I wanna make an invitation. Come on, you're here this morning. You haven't made Jesus Lord of your life. You haven't submitted your life to God. Come on, he's the creator of everything. He knows you inside and out. He knows you better than you know yourself. He knew you before you were born. He's outside of time. He can see everything. He knew that you needed a savior. He knew that you needed forgiveness of your sins. He knew that somebody had to stand in the place for you and take your punishment so that you could be right with him. God knew that. And he sent Jesus, his only begotten son to the earth to die for our sins, to take a brutal death, brutal death, died for us, and then God raised him from the dead. And with him, he raised us to new life. Come on, that's the promise we have in Christ if we'll say yes to Jesus. So if you're here this morning and you have not given your life to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, this is a pivotal moment for you. This is a decision you will never forget. It's the best decision to say yes to him. It's the best decision you'll ever make in your life to say yes to Jesus. God's done everything he can to bring you into the kingdom. Now it's your choice. Heaven votes for you. Hell votes against you, you cast the deciding vote. So if you wanna be included in a prayer, we're all gonna pray, all of us. We pray this every week. We pray it and confess it because we believe it, that Jesus is Lord. He is the son of God. God did raise him from the dead. We pray it and confess every week. If you wanna be included in this prayer, I'm asking you, between you and me and Jesus, nobody else looking around, just you, me, and Jesus is what I'm asking. Let me know by looking at me with your eyes, slip your hand up where I can see it, whatever you gotta do to get my attention. And we're gonna pray this prayer, all of us, all of us together to confess Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Invite him in. He's the best thing to happen to you ever. So I'm gonna look around just for a minute. You wanna be included in this prayer. We're gonna pray it. We're gonna honor him. We're gonna give him lordship of our life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I see those eyes. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. He's good. He's faithful. I see those eyes. Anybody else? Saying yes to him. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's pray this prayer together. Let's mean it from our hearts. He's a good God. He hears us. He loves us. When this is a change for the good, amen? Pray this after me. Father God, I believe Jesus is Lord. He is your son. He came to this earth. He died for my sins. And God, you raised him from the dead. Jesus, I'm asking you, come into my life. Be my savior and my Lord. Forgive me of all my sins and make me brand new. I ask you to fill me with your peace, with your joy, and with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, he's a good God, amen.